This video is sponsored by Skillshare. A lot of Americans are committed to the idea that America is the greatest country in the world. Some conservatives in particular like to accuse people of hating America whenever they try to tackle or even merely point out potential structural problems that plague the country. But even many people with more left-leaning political views often have a hard time dealing with the assertion that maybe there are some fundamental problems with the way that this country operates. So whenever systemic problems are suggested, they default into finding something else to blame. It couldn't possibly be that bigotry and injustice are baked into the very fabric of the United States, because that would be a pretty strong argument against this country being so great. And I'm sure that other countries have similar discussions as well in their society, but as usual, I can mostly only speak from an American perspective. In America, one of the most prevalent examples of this is with regard to how we talk about the poor. The general attitude towards poor people in America is pretty abhorrent. We often think of the poor as lazy, drug addicted, uncivilized people who sit around and wait for the government to bail them out of the consequences of their own bad decisions. In this way, the poor are depicted as bad people who got what they deserved rather than victims of a system that is intentionally designed to exploit and marginalize them. This is an especially fitting example because America is always billed as this great land of opportunity that rewards those who persist and work hard. So if you are poor and out of luck, that's just proof that you didn't work hard enough or didn't make good enough decisions. It certainly couldn't be any fundamental problem with the system as a whole. These types of arguments are also used within the context of race and racism. For decades, American concern trolls have been discussing just what black people need to do to lift themselves out of lives of poverty and crime. Everything from drugs to rap music has been blamed for destroying black communities. Some particularly embarrassing people have suggested that black people are genetically predisposed to worse outcomes than other races. Remember when that was all over the place on the internet a couple years ago? Most of these theories have their day in the sun briefly and then kind of fall out of the mainstream discourse and are relegated to the darkest corners of country clubs and anonymous message boards, only to be immediately replaced by something else, of course. But there is one scapegoat that seems to have stood the test of time. I'm referring, of course, to the idea of the erosion of the black family, and more specifically, the idea of the absent black father. This has always been a common argument for why black people generally have a lower standard of living than white people, even during and before the civil rights era. Like, imagine living during Jim Crow and redlining and all that shit and still blaming generational poverty on black men. Hi, I'm T1J. Follow me. This video, like all my videos, would not be possible without my members and patrons, including homies like a mnemonic device, Enchanted Sleeper, Dr. Diplodocus, and Dylan Smith. If you'd like to support the channel, you can become a homie yourself by clicking the join button below the video or by checking out my page on Patreon. The idea that black families are devastated by absent fathers still persists today, even among well-meaning people, many of whom might consider themselves allies to the black community. I'm looking at 500 young brothers that don't have a dad in their life. That's a problem. And I'm on a mission to help reverse that curse. Even people who ostensibly acknowledge that institutional and systemic barriers exist for black people still sometimes argue that repairing the family structure is an important step for improving the lives of black Americans. Former Democratic President Barack Obama gave an entire speech about the supposed problem of missing black fathers back in 2008. But this concept is also a pet argument for right-wingers and others who are less likely to concede that there may be factors outside of these people's control that lead to these problems. Popular conservative personality Larry Elder has argued that black fatherlessness is the number one problem facing black Americans today. 
Now, normally in a video like this, I would carefully lay out all the arguments and have an elegant narrative arc that gradually leads to the conclusion at the end. All right, let's be honest, I'm probably giving myself too much credit here. But for this one, I'm going to kind of spoil it here up front. The concept of the absent black father is a myth. It's not real. This topic is especially interesting to me as a black person who was mostly raised by a single mother, but whose father also made every attempt to be involved in my life. It's a pernicious stereotype, but unlike other stereotypes, which are normally only spoken out loud by the kind of person who has a Confederate flag in their front window or that kid in your Call of Duty game, this one is covered extensively by serious politicians and presenters and depicted in news and media as if it is just an unfortunate fact of life. Father of Sons is a crisis in our country, particularly in the African-American community. It is an epidemic. It is an epidemic. Now, outside of stereotypical media depictions, this idea mostly stems from an erroneous conflation of being unmarried with being absent. Because according to the CDC, it is true that around 70% of black people who had children in 2018 were unmarried. It's also true that black couples have a higher divorce rate than other races. But as I just mentioned, being unmarried does not automatically imply that the father is not involved in the child's life. In fact, a separate CDC report found that whether or not they live with the child, black fathers are actually more actively involved in the children's life than their counterparts of other races. And when they do live with their children, black fathers are still more likely to closely interact with and care for them through activities such as bathing, helping with homework, or explaining why they feel all tingly whenever they watch Fern Gully. All right, maybe that last one is just me. Now, the one part of this idea that may hold a little weight is the rate at which black fathers, for whatever reason, end up not living with their children. According to the Pew Research Center, 44% of black fathers live apart from at least one of their children. And of course, it's much harder to be a constant presence in a child's life if you don't live with them. But as I already mentioned, black fathers who don't live with their children have been found to be more present in their children's lives than parents of other races. And while 44% is a significant number, it warrants discussion, it's less than half. It's not this destructive plague in the way that people like to talk about it. So yeah, this epidemic of black fatherlessness is not really a thing. But some people may still be alarmed at the high rate at which black families have children when they're not married. Of course, family stability results in better outcomes for children. And there's plenty of data that supports the idea that these outcomes are much better for married parents than cohabiting or single ones in almost every measurable way, honestly. But as you might imagine, it's not some magical spell that gets cast on the family as soon as you say, I do. And listen, just like everything else, it's fucking complicated. But it's worth it to try and find out what it is about marriage that results in all of these benefits for children. An analysis by the Brookings Institution found that parenting behavior plays a large role in the future success of the child, which is probably not a surprise to anyone. Things like showing care and physical affection for the child or reading and playing with the child are associated with things like higher rates of high school and college graduation and lower rates of crime. It doesn't tell the whole story, of course, but there seems to be a very strong association. Perhaps married people are more likely to exhibit these behaviors for various reasons, maybe a stronger commitment to the family or the reduced likelihood of unplanned or unwanted pregnancies, for example. But Brookings also found that another reason why married couples have so much better outcomes for their children is, and you probably guessed this by now, they tend to have more money. And again, this is for various reasons, the most basic of which is just math. Multiple earners are better than one. But also, it's just more common for people with higher incomes to choose to get married in the first place. 
And like I implied before, it's not like a money fairy shows up at your wedding and gives you the blessing of income as soon as you exchange your vows. In fact, the financial situation often gets more complicated after marriage. The pre-existing socioeconomic status of the people involved will affect whether they choose to get married and will also affect whether they stay married if they do. It's also worth mentioning Yo, it ain't the 50s anymore. Ideas about premarital sex and non-marital childbirth have evolved heavily over time. The prevalence of rushed shotgun weddings as soon as someone got pregnant has dropped drastically. People are fine with fucking outside of marriage and they don't feel any specific obligation to get married before having children. So then I guess the last rebuttal to this would be something like, well, why don't black people stop having children if they can't afford them or give them a bright future? And listen, I think it is a very good idea to think carefully about bringing a new life into this world if you know that you're gonna have trouble providing for them or setting them up for a promising future. But who the hell am I or you or anyone to tell someone else how to live their life? It's a very personal situation and decision, and it's kind of none of our business. And of course, sometimes things happen unexpectedly and you have to figure out how to deal with the consequences. But the issue here is not that black fathers are missing from their kids' lives or that black people are having too many kids out of wedlock. The issue is that black Americans live in a country that is still tainted by the legacy of slavery and legalized oppression and are systematically marginalized by almost every institution. From employment to wages, to healthcare, to representation in government, to housing, and of course, law enforcement and criminal justice, which I made a couple videos about recently. While this catastrophe of broken black families is an exaggeration, black people do get the shorter end of the stick when it comes to family. For example, part of the reason that black men are more likely to be apart from their families is because black men are also more likely to be arrested imprisoned or killed by the criminal justice system. Yes, there's some measure of personal responsibility and decision making that can cause problems, of course. But by and large, in general, statistically, these are the systems that make it not impossible, but disproportionately difficult for black people to put themselves in a position to create families with socioeconomically beneficial outcomes. I mean, is the argument that successful, healthy and wealthy people never made any bad decisions in their life? And even if you're going to make that ridiculous argument, you can still point back to the systemic problems. These same factors lead to things like limited access to healthcare services, subpar sex education, and financial strife in the household. But also, some people just want to have kids. And I think it's rude AF to tell Black people to basically wait for systemic racism to disappear before they're allowed to enjoy and build families. And it's even ruder to accuse Black parents of not doing the best they can to care for their kids, when a lot of cases, they're doing better than you. That's just me though. What do you think? I wanna take a moment to go ahead and thank the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for the curious and the creative that offers thousands of classes on various topics, including illustration, music, business, productivity, and much, much more. Whether you're an excited beginner, a casual dabbler, or an expert looking to hone their skills, there's something on Skillshare for you. A great class I recommend is Artivism, Create Inspiring Art for Change, in which artist and activist Nicholas Smith gives ideas about how you can use visual art to help heal societal wounds and potentially change the world. Skillshare classes like this one are organized into short lessons, and most of them are under 60 minutes total, so they're designed to fit any schedule. And you can get an annual premium membership, which includes unlimited access to thousands of classes just like that one for under $10 a month. But if you'd like to try it out, the first 1,000 people to click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. So go ahead and click the link in the description below and start learning today. And remember, by supporting sponsors like Skillshare, you not only get access to a great service, but you also support me and help me take my content to the next level.